And then out of all of this, I just want to suggest you still can't have a healthy society unless you have respect for others. The respect for others really does mean putting together and working together in a way that given all the characteristics I just outlined, you've got to give others the, those same characteristics. Now, if you take all that, I think I have a summary question that, that will last for a long time. And it's this, that the key question for all public policy should be, will this proposal help people become more responsible, more productive, and more safe so they can be prosperous and free, so they can pursue happiness? I want you to notice that set. More responsible, more productive, more safe. If I give you money, does that make you more responsible or less? If I give you money, does that make you more productive or does it may actually encourage you to, be, to not worry about your productivity? What, what are you doing? And notice what the goals are here. So you can become prosperous and free, so you can pursue happiness. We, don't get, we never guarantee happiness. We guarantee pursuit. Now in that framework, I want to suggest to you that the greatest failure of the welfare state was its direct and indirect undermining of personal strength. That the actual effect of the welfare state is to weaken and cripple the poor, to encourage more people to slide into poverty, and to set up a structure in which personal strength decayed because of the very actions of government behavior. So it's not should we have a cheap welfare state or an expensive welfare state, it is the structure and culture and psychology of the welfare state which is devastating because it destroys personal strength. And we're going to spend two hours in this later on talking about how we replace it towards the end of the quarter. But for the moment I want to go back and just say to you, the best single work I mentioned earlier is Olasky, The Tragedy of American Compassion, because it really, really outlines what the welfare state has done and what used to work. And in fact, there's a column in Newsweek this week which points out that this book and another book which I haven't read yet by B. Himmelfarb on Victorian morality says flatly, in the 19th century there was a steady drop in poverty, alcoholism, and addiction, and in fact we were winning the struggle. And the model was radically different than the elite model we've tried for the last 30 years. What I'm suggesting to you is the welfare state attitudes, taxes, and regulations discourage work which undermines perseverance, discipline, and responsibility. That the whole structure of the welfare state actually cripples us. I'm also suggesting that the welfare state undermines the family. And in fact, as I may have mentioned the other day, the earned income tax credit, if you earn $11,000 a year and you marry somebody who earns $11,000 a year, you lose $4,600 in earned income tax credit by the act of marriage. And then we wonder why people don't get married. Now, a, a state which punishes marriage by taking over 20% of your income by getting married is crazy. It is literally certifiably nuts. And it has destructive behavior. The welfare state, the sheer volume of rules and regulations undermines integrity. The fact is, when you have enough red tape, you cheat on it. That is a fact. It may not be desirable, but it's a fact. How many of you found yourself at some point in the last year fudging on something, where you, you know you broke some rule. Just raise your hand. First of all, okay. So why should it shock you that a person on food stamps does the same thing? Why should it shock you that a person on AFDC does the same thing? Why should it shock you that a person in public housing does the same thing? We have built a law-dominated, bureaucratically dominated, red tape dominated system in which virtually everybody believes they should cheat at something. Not that they mean to be bad, but after all, we all know we do it. I mean, how often do people say, yeah, well, you, you can do it. It doesn't really, it's not a real rule. Right? Sort of a rule. It's a rule that matters if they catch you. That is, that is a cancer at the heart of a free society. You want to have few rules ruthlessly enforced, rather than many, many rules mostly neglected. Furthermore, the welfare state's litigation system attacks virtually every aspect of personal strength. Somebody's in a car wreck, you stop to help them, you get sued for malpractice. And have you ever thought about how many different ways you're now legally vulnerable so the trial lawyers can get richer? And how much that biases against the system? Uh, in addition, what happens is people come to rely on government instead of their own strength. That instead of focusing on how can I be personally strong, people focus on how to get the government to send the money. You owe me. Now, this core assertion of this, which I think all the Founding Fathers would have agreed with, is that governments can't give you 
what you don't earn. And when governments try to give you what you haven't earned, the result is loss of self-respect, loss of humanness, and the rise of pathologies. And I think that's where we are today. Now, our vision is, first of all, everyone can have personal strength. And I would debate this anywhere in the country. When you, and you're going to see in a little while Max Cleland and hear his story. You've seen Charles Krauthammer on television. When you see the examples of people of courage who overcome tremendous odds, Senator Bob Dole, and then, 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 they, then you see an able-bodied person tell you that they're a victim and it's just too hard. What you've got to say to them is get a grip on yourself. Everybody can have personal strength. Our vision is that with effort, help, and faith, extraordinary things can happen. And now, before anybody says, oh yeah, Gingrich is just talking about, once again, all those rich people who are able-bodied get to do good things. He doesn't care about those who have real problems. I want you to listen to a leading Democrat, Secretary of State of Georgia, Max Cleland, and really, I think you're going to be very impressed by this, this uh, interview. I was uh, about 15 miles east, uh, setting up a radio relay site on a mountain and had gotten off the helicopter and with my radio team and uh, looked down and there was a grenade. I, I didn't think it was live and uh, I really thought it was mine. I thought it had fell off my web gear and stuff. So I was carrying the M16 in this hand and uh, reached down to get it. And just before I reached it, it went off. So uh, I was absolutely stunned and terrified, obviously, and looked down and my right hand wasn't there. And looked down my right leg wasn't there my left leg was so badly mangled, uh, it was amputated within the hour. So within the space of one hour, uh, I was, uh, number one, lucky to survive, but number two, uh, lost three limbs right there. Bad things happen to good people, and difficulties happen to uh, people in life, but uh, that doesn't mean it has to stop you. And my heroes now are the people who uh, went on to succeed regardless. Um, people like Abraham Lincoln who ran for public office many, many times and lost and ultimately ended up President of the United States in 1860. Or Thomas Edison who was uh, told by his teachers he was too stupid to learn and went on to become the most prolific inventor of modern times. Or Helen Keller who worked through three devastating disabilities, blindness, deafness, and the inability to talk worked through that and became a great humanitarian. So uh, my heroes now are people who are able to work through the valley of the shadow and uh, come out, as Hemingway said, strong as broken places. So in many ways, I think I'm probably stronger because of that experience, uh, but it hadn't been easy. Uh, it's possible to be strong after injury or adversity or tragedy. It is possible, but it's not easy. So in terms of personal strength, I think what happens is you find it along the way. <clears throat> People say to me, oh, I couldn't do that. Well, if that happened to me, uh, I'd never have the energy or strength to get out, of, get out of the bed or get out of the corner or go do things. You really don't know what you can do. I think that's uh, one of the things I've learned. You never, uh, that there's a great power and potential in the human body, mind, and spirit uh, when it uh, goes all out either to fight for survival, or to fight for some goal, or for some idea, or just to fight for one's own dignity. Uh, Viktor Frankl, the great psychiatrist out of World War II, said that uh, to live is to suffer, to survive is to find meaning in suffering. I think when something dramatic happens to you, something traumatic happens to you, uh, loss of limbs, loss of friends or family, a divorce, uh, some catastrophe in your life. You spend a long time thereafter trying to sort out what it all means. You have a search for meaning. And the ability to survive after that depends on your ability to find some kind of meaning out of it all. As I was going through my valleys and struggling so much with the Vietnam experience and a sense of loss and hurt and trying to make sense of it, trying to find a sense of meaning and purpose out of it. These words meant a lot to me, and, and as I've continued my struggle and my search for my own destiny and 
how things are going to work out for me and what I should be doing and so forth. A lot of the answers of life, so to speak. This prayer has meant more and more to me, not less and less. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am, among all men, most richly blessed. What's your reaction? 